Affairs. It's a great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, uh, Annie Sasko, and I are colleagues in the uh, uh, IDEA network, uh, International Epidemiology Databases for Research on AIDS, roughly. And uh, of course, um, uh, many of you know um, uh, Kathy McGowan from the Department of Medicine and Dan Masis, recently retired from uh, Health uh, Medical Informatics, who spearheaded the, uh, the Vanderbilt component, which focuses on Central America. Uh, Dr. Sasko works uh, intensively with the West African group, very distinguished. They have more patients than we do in their database, I have to confess. And, uh, and they've been very productive in the first cycle of the IDEA uh, networks. This is a series of seven networks around the world, four in Africa, one in Asia and Australia, which has a brand new China component, by the way, a separate China component to that network. They're going to keep that segregated to help the Chinese manage their data. And then uh, one in North America, and then the one we I just mentioned, South America. Um, uh, Annie is the, the director of the Epidemiology for uh, Cancer Prevention team uh, in INSERM. Uh, those of you who don't know that acronym, that's the French NIH. But unlike the American NIH, which is um, sort of intramural based in the D.C. area um, and then spreads its money extramurally, INSERM actually nests itself within universities throughout France. And, uh, and Annie is in her hometown of Bordeaux. Uh, where she went to medical school and then subsequently did her training in cancer epidemiology with a couple of master's degrees and her doctorate at Harvard University. She worked at uh, arguably the world's distinguished, most distinguished institution for cancer epidemiology, which is uh, nicknamed IARC, the uh, uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, and uh, IARC is really a, a center of uh, expertise in the global cancer arena. Annie is also um, personally very devoted to issues of cancer in developing countries and has been doing a series of cancer uh, epidemiology training se uh, seminars all over the world, including North America and the Middle East, North Africa and the Middle East. Um, her background not only includes uh, bread and butter important issues in cancer epidemiology, but also a special focus over the years in uh, food additives in the animal husbandry industry. As you know, we throw hormones and uh, antibiotics and uh, food additives of every kind into animals, and it's an especially elegant and complex agenda to study the impact on human disease of something that's done to non-humans. And to follow that path uh, down the road uh, is especially challenging. She's distinguished her in, in that area. In fact, they've even honored her with a, uh, um, a visiting faculty appointment in the veterinary school at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She's also on the adjunct faculty of the University of Pittsburgh. And for those of you who don't know, that's a very distinguished environmental epidemiology group up there. So I could go on and on about Annie and her 400 plus publications and, uh, and, and her uh, uh, Nobel Prize nomination a number of years back. and. Uh, all these other things, but we'll let her talk about the challenge of cancer in the world in an area of globalization. Thank you. It's a <laughs> thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be here today, and, uh, and I'm glad to have been invited to Nashville, to Vanderbilt in particular, and I hope I'll be coming back. What I'm going to do today is discuss with you the challenge of cancer in the world in this... What's the problem? The lights. The lights. Oh, there it is. 50? 75. 75. Hold on. 75. In an era of globalization, and why is there an in at the end? That I don't know. I, I got it wrong, the last word. But we will discuss this issue. What do we know about cancer? Uh, and what can we do about it? In order to act in a responsible way against any disease, is cancer is no exception, I think, first of all, it helps to know what the disease is. So to know from a medical point of view which kind of disease we are talking about and to have some idea of a world cancer burden in terms both of mortality and of morbidity, of incidence, 
because if you look at one or the other, you will not get exactly the same picture, and in fact, they are complementary. But the main issue for the epidemiologist I am is to look at the search for risk and preventive factor, because I think knowledge is good, but it's not good enough, and we need to apply that knowledge for action to try to change something to the health of population of the world, in particular, as far as cancer is concerned, through national cancer control programs or any other programs at a national or sub-national level. So today, I will discuss about cancer. And quite often, there's a lot of misconception about cancer, which has been described for decades as a disease of so-called civilization, old age, and some specific social classes or some specific population. In fact, this is in part true, but also it's untrue, and it has never been really true. In fact, cancer has always existed in a way, can be found at all ages. One can be born with cancer, about one newborn in 10,000 with neonatal cancer, and it's not therefore only the disease of the aging, it's found in all population, human populations, but also in animal population, as far as we know. Of course, we don't have data on all animal population, but in pets, in cats, in dogs, and in cows, and in whatever, we find cancer, and also in animals in the wild. And the oldest cases reported of cancer include cancer found in skeletons of dinosaurs. So it always existed. What has changed over the centuries and the millennia has been that the occurrence is increasing and of course not all populations are equally affected by cancer and not by the same cancers. So it's a disease which is of interest to study but not very easy because it's a plurifactorial disease. You always have several risk factors. It's not one virus, one disease. It's more complex than that with a long latency. It takes sometimes very little time. I talked about neonatal cancers. So there it's very fast, but most of the time it takes 10, 20, 40 years to get a cancer after exposure to a carcinogen. For example, 40 years for asbestos. So it does not make it easy once someone gets sick with a disease to find out the reason why she or he got cancer because the exposure may have occurred as far back as 20 years in the past. The prognosis of cancer remains serious. Of course, we have made big progress since the time I was in medical school, but we are far yet of uh, getting rid of cancer even if I'm tired of hearing that within 10 years we will save them all, cure them all, um, that doesn't seem to work. And even if we were able to cure all cancer, I think given a lot of the cancers can be avoided, we really have to work on prevention, not only for an issue of cost, I don't care much about economics, but for the issue of suffering of people and their families. So what I will do today is show you some aspect of descriptive epidemiology because it's a starting point for thinking about differences between population and therefore identification of potential risk or preventive factors. And also for looking a little bit at the evolution of cancer over time because that also tells us something of the reasons why the disease is changing. So first of all, some maps of geographical epidemiology. You can find these maps on the internet, on the website of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the IRC. They are free access, so anyone can get these kind of maps if you want to make a presentation. You just go on that site, look at the databases, Globocan, and then here it comes and you have all kinds of diagrams which are available and all figures with estimates of cancer in all countries of the world. So if you look at this type of map, here I have put the map for men of all ages and for all cancers as a group. We can see that there are some continents which have more cancers than other and North America is leading the pack, but also Europe, Western and Northern Europe, Australia and New Zealand. 
By contrast, countries in Africa or in the Middle East and India still have quite low rates. But you can see there that already China and the ex-USSR, uh, the bloc of Eastern uh, countries, have quite high rates of all cancer for men, and in Mongolia, very high rates of um, all cancer in men. If we look now at a few uh, specific cancers, I have put in here a breast cancer in women. It also exists in men, but it's very rare, so the map is not produced for men. For women, and again, we find the leading position of North America, USA and Canada, as well as Western and Northern Europe, Australia, New Zealand. But you also find some countries on the South American continent, and there, in fact, it's a little bit surprising uh, because usually breast cancer is a very good indicator of the economic development of a country, and there it's a little too high compared to the economic level of these countries. But in a way, in part, it may be traced back, although it's an argument in favor of the role, in fact, of uh, growth promoters in animal husbandry. You know that countries like Argentina, Uruguay, most, uh, sell a huge amount of meat all over the world, and they were very big users in the past of DES, diethylstilrestrol, which then has been banned as a growth promoter, but over hormonal products. Now, officially, it's forbidden, and officially, it's not being used there. But given the people eat huge quantity of meats in this country three times a day, then it may play a role. Although, of course, it's not definite proof, as some of my colleagues would say. It's just an argument in favor of. Here, I have put a very different map, which is the one of liver cancer in men. Um, to show that in this case, the countries at high risk are China, and in fact, uh, it's uh, all China. Also, some countries in Africa, in Western Africa, in Central Africa, South Africa, and one country in Latin America. So, liver cancer there, it's the reverse picture, the mirror image of what we had for all cancer or for breast cancer i.e. the countries at highest risk are the ones which were at lowest risk for breast cancer, for example, and some other um, cancers, such as colon cancer, which I didn't show you, or others. What does this show? It shows one thing which is important, is that the reason why we had countries in green before and with low rates is not just because people do not know how to can cancer in the South and in Africa in particular, but because the repartition of the cancers is different. And here, when we are looking at cancers linked to biological agents, then we find that the highest rates are, in fact, in the continents which have the highest prevalence of these infectious agents. If I had put on here nasopharyngeal cancer, also there we would have seen an excess in part of China, in the Canton region, in the Guangzhou region, and we would have seen uh, North, North Africa. And, uh, and similarly for um, stomach cancer and all other cancers linked to biological agents. So in fact, if we look at the global picture, we can still see two well-contrasted zones with cancers mostly linked to biological agents essentially being seen in countries of what I call the South, not the South, the South or sense, American sense of the South of the United States, even if we are in the South here, but the political South in a way, which is Africa, uh, South America, Asia, of course, excluding, uh, they are still in the South, Australia and New Zealand. So, uh, and there's always a problem on how to call this country. The tropics, I tend to prefer in these days, maybe. In any event, that's what we are talking about. And in countries of the so-called north, including Australia, then we have cancers linked to behavioral and environmental factors. But what we see today is already a picture which became somewhat blurred compared to the very sharp contrast we had 20 years ago. And these differences are going to diminish because they reflect whatever happened in terms of exposure 
for the past 25 years, not what happens in terms of exposure nowadays. And I bet that 25 years down the road, the picture will be much less contrasted than it is nowadays, and we will see why. So when we see these kind of differences, how can we explain that? And there are three possibilities. It can be because people are different. It's true that the genetic makeup of someone who's a Chinese is not exactly the same for one of the African or an American or an Australian or an European or whatever. But it may also be because the lifestyle and behavior of people is different and because they live in a different environment. So in the old days, when we didn't, did not know how to slide up the genome to look at the uh, true gene composition, we had a tool which was nevertheless very informative, which was the study of migrant population to know what happens in terms of cancer rate when Chinese move from China to the United States, when Italians move to Australia, and when a lot of groups from different countries in the world move to Israel. And that's what I, I cannot resist to a very old graph I did by hand, not even on a computer, in the old days, 1989, uh, in, uh, in French, so it's in French, about breast cancer incidents for different groups of Chinese women, with a reference being the white women, the Caucasian women in, um, in uh, the, the solid line. Uh, that's the white women in the USA. And down there, we have the Chinese women living in the People's Republic of China. Then we have the Chinese women living in Hong Kong, which is still on the Chinese continent, but already had somewhat of a different lifestyle, especially back in the years of 70s, 60s, 70s. And then two groups which have quite a lot of variation because they are based on smaller numbers, the Chinese women living in the Chinatown of uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And what we see on this graph is that the Chinese women in China had low rates of breast cancer at any age. But the Chinese women in Hong Kong already had higher rates, and the Chinese women in the States even higher rates. So with a similar genetic background, but changing lifestyle, the risk of disease changed not for the woman who migrate herself, but for her daughters and more so even for her granddaughters. So when you change your way of living and your environment, the risk of cancer change. I had in that paper a similar graph for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. I said before that it's very frequent in the Guangzhou region of China, and there it was exactly the reverse. The top curve was the Chinese in China, and, and the Chinese in Hong Kong, because they are given it's Guangzhou, Hong Kong, it's next door. So they, they were almost exactly similar, it's the same population. <coughs> and then the Chinese in the States, and then almost down to zero, the white population in the States. So this type of simple graph, which of course is never going to get us the Nobel Prize, nevertheless tells something. Now we will look at the evolution over time. Here I've put a graph from 1980 to 2000. I will update when the data will be out for 2010. Uh, based on the data collected by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, so based on cancer registries in the world uh, in a similar way, I mean collected in a similar way over the years, although the number of cancer registries, of course, um, increased, and then extrapolations for the countries where we do not have cancer registries. In the 1980, when the first volume of the um, IRC uh, cancer incidents in five continents was published, uh, even before that, in fact, a little before, uh, there were 6.3 million cancer cases a year in the world, estimated, in 2000, we were at 10 million, and now we are at 12 million. So in fact, over a 28 um, uh, years period, more or less, there was a doubling in the number of cancer cases. 
That's just the number. And then we are expecting that, of course, this increase will continue. We are expecting about 16 million for 2020, with increases in all continents of the world, but in particular in, in Africa as well as in Asia. So the total burden of disease, when the picture is very clear, there have been increases that no one can deny. But of course, faced with that increase, there are three potential explanations. In fact, they all play a role. There has been an increase in the population of the world. There has been an aging of a population in many countries, and that's very important given the frequency of cancer, of most cancer increases with age. But that's not good enough, and when we control for population size and aging through very standard age standardization or other more sophisticated modeling methods, there remain, unfortunately, a true increase in the occurrence of disease. And again, this is not only due to better diagnosis. There's really something true. If we look at mortality rates, then the picture is different in the industrialized country and in the rest of the world. In the industrialized country, then we see some improvement or at least stable mortality rates from cancer because it's true that for some cancer, they have a huge improvement in treatment. I think the best example is cancer of the testis. In young men, when I was in medical school, the um, probability of dying within five years of diagnosis was 95%. And then thanks to the good uh, chemotherapy, uh, it has improved. Now the survival is 95%. So there are a few cancers where there has been really a dramatic change in prognosis. And in many other cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, a lot of the common cancers, through combination of therapies, surgery plus radiotherapy plus chemotherapy plus hormonal therapy plus immunotherapy plus whatever, there has been a large uh, improvement. So it's true that we die somewhat less of uh, cancer once we get it now than we did in the past. And also that, of course, this is helped by early detection and screening. But that does not apply to the whole world. For the vast majority of the population of the world, people are, have uh, increasing mortality rates because they don't have access to treatment or very limited access to treatment. They don't have early detection. They don't have screening. And therefore, given there is also an increase in the incidence of disease, then of course, mortality is also going up. In terms of incident rates, and not crude numbers, as I had on the graphic, on the histogram, uh, the trends are different for different cancers. There are some cancers which are decreasing almost all over the world, and the best examples are stomach cancer and cervical cancer. But for most cancers, uh, there are still increases. And then for some cancers in some parts of the world, there have been decreases, for example, male lung cancer or ENT cancers in countries where finally we have got uh, serious uh, tobacco control programs. So that has an impact, of course, and they went down in the USA, in Canada, in Europe, in most of Europe. Uh, there have been also recent decreases, for example, in breast cancer in the USA and in Europe due to the change in the use of hormone replacement therapy and potentially other causes also. But the majority image, in a way, remains quite bad and usually things are getting worse. So um, what do we do with this increase in cancer incidence rate? And there, depending on who the speaker is, you will have, of course, a very different emphasis being given to all the potential complementary, according to my view, reasons for the increase. It's true that there is a much better diagnosis now of some cancers. For example, pancreatic cancer, it's a cancer which is somewhat difficult, was somewhat difficult to diagnose in the old days, 
because uh, it's a very rapid evolving cancer, so people are turning uh, yellow, and within three weeks they may be dead. At the time, it was diff it's difficult to do a biopsy because it's an internal, uh, somewhat profound organ, so most probably in the past, the number of pancreatic cancer were just considered as pancreatitis, and there was no imaging techniques, so now, of course, we make the diagnosis. So for some cancers, of course, better diagnosis play a role. A change in classification also play a role. For example, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, you very well know that non-Hodgkin lymphoma, it's not one tumor, it's a family of tumor with somewhat different uh, evolving trends. And of course, by grouping differently, this different lymphoma, then we can get changes in the apparent inc incidence rate whereas it's more a change in classification. Somewhat of a similar consideration may partly apply to brain tumor and the fact that in the past it was impossible to make a distinction between benign and malignant tumors because again, I mean, it's not easy to do a brain biopsy. Um, and now with better imaging techniques, of course, we do things better. Then there is the issue of screening Screening may prevent, for some cancer, death from cancer, but creates also the disease, in a way, um, by calling cancer a very small lesion which would have gone totally unnoticed in people who would have died of something else. And the best example, and I'll show you one graph, is prostate cancer. But it also plays a role in breast cancer. But even if we take into account all of these potential explanations, there remains this last line, which is that the increase may be real. So this is, the more, I love this slide. I mean, this slide, I think, is um, something I always show when I'm teaching. Um, it's produced by the American Cancer Society, and I should have written the reference in there. Um, it looks at the evolution over time of incidence cancer rates in men in the USA from the 70s to the end of the 90s. And you have this green line for prostate cancer, which is truly unbelievable for non-infectious disease, um, with this uh, skyrocketing incidence rate then falling down. What happened with prostate cancer is that, of course, the PSA was set up as a test for screening for cancer, and that a lot of people who could afford it started screening for prostate cancer um, by the 80s, including in very young men. I mean, very young meaning by the age of 45. Um, and then, of course, they found a lot of increased PSA and a lot when they did biopsy of some tiny prostate cancer. So it really went up. But then, of course, treating even this tiny prostate cancer is linked to some risk, radiotherapy, uh, may lead to uh, problems, urinary problems, uh, importance following surgery. So, I mean, the kind of things which are side effects that men tend not to like. So then they felt that maybe they were starting a little young and they uh, started screening at a later age and then the, the curve dropped down. Nevertheless, the uh, overall trend is of an increase, even if we forget about this beautiful picture. So how can we therefore explain these increases which I consider true in incidence? And that's the role of etiologic epidemiology, the search for risk of preventive factors. And I will just give you an overall image. Based on a program of the IRC, which is uh, leading to the identification of carcinogens. How do you decide something is a carcinogen? Uh, and there you have to look at all available evidence. So before you are able to establish a link, possibly a causal link between one exposure and one disease, you have to look at the human studies. So that's mostly essentially epidemiological population-based study, but also clinical study, and also sometimes ecological studies. So the issue of uh, geographical analysis, time trends, this kind of uh, other data sets which may be available. And then we look also at experimental studies, 
done in experimental, in lab animals, in guinea pigs, in rats, in uh, mice, in whatever, uh, small mammals usually, because although we want to believe that we are very different from a mouse, we are not that different from a genetic point of view, and in fact, almost all carcinogens without exceptions, which have been demonstrated as carcinogen in mice or rats or guinea pigs, with the latency 20 years later, tend up to be also carcinogen in humans once we have sufficient data. Uh, and then we also look at other type of study to, in particular, try to understand how a given agent leads to cancer, so looking at the mechanism of carcinogenesis. This type of exercise has been done for the last 30 years by a program at IRC, which is called the IRC monographs for the evaluation of carcinogenicity <coughs> to humans up to 1970. It was called to man, and then they changed to humans. Because it was strange to say that tamoxifen was carcinogen for men, whereas it was uh, leading to endometrial cancer, but nevertheless. So humans fit better. So this program was created back in 1969 by Lorenzo Tomatis, who was uh, the uh, director of IRC for 10 years and who managed to get support for that program, mostly from the NCI, the US NCI, but also uh, from the European Commission. And the objective of the IRC program is to prepare, in fact, monographs with a critical review of all existing literature on a given agent and then ending up with a classification of the carcinogenicity. So the monographs should be seen only as a first step. It's an issue of identification of the hazard of cancer, saying yes, this is a carcinogen. It doesn't really go into details or even not at all in the issue of dose, of a threshold. It just will relate whatever is available in the epidemiological literature, but we do not do within the monograph modelization or extrapolation outside the range of the exposures for which we have real data. And also the IRC stop at saying this is a carcinogen. Then it doesn't say what should you do about it because that's the re responsibility of the governments or some other international recommendation. So the work of IRC stops when they say this is a carcinogen. And then it's for governments to do if they want something about it. So the IRC program, it's about 15 people, which means that of course they cannot look at all agents in the world. There have been thousands and thousands of chemicals introduced on the market, millions of products. So we cannot evaluate everything. So there are two main criteria for deciding to do an evaluation. One, that of course humans should be exposed to a significant extent. So if it's only one tiny group which has a specific exposures, although it would be of interest for that group, and of that doesn't lead to a monograph. And of course, we need to have some suspicion of carcinogenicity. So the way the IRC monograph is working is that uh, the secretariat, the IRC uh, scientists are preparing a document with the help of invited experts from all countries all over the world, the people who have worked on this topic, which then came to IARC in Lyon to work in subgroup, one on exposure, to quantify how much human population are exposed, one on epidemiology, one on animal carcinogenicity, and one on the other relevant data. These subgroups work separately for a few days, and then they all come together to discuss everything uh, in the whole group, and then the invited experts, not the IRC staff, will decide on the final evaluation, and in uh, now the recent years, have voted on the final evaluation. In the end, in the old days, it was done by consensus, but now things are becoming more complex, so it ended up being a vote. So the data are reported in the form of, they are the orange books, I don't know if you have ever seen them, 
and they are again available, at least most of them, uh, online freely on the IRC website. So you can find all these books if you are interested in something and you can find the tables to find out what a given agent is. So we uh, summarize the exposure data, the carcinogenicity in humans, the carcinogenicity in animals, and any other things. In the other things uh, I put on this slide, but then there are too many things to read, but nevertheless, it means we look at genotoxicity study, at study of metabolism, at studies on cell behavior. So anything which has been published in the peer-reviewed literature on a given compound is looked at. And then we will summarize what we think about this data. First, for the epidemiological data, a sufficient evidence when we have a number of studies, concordant study, all of them finding an increased risk of cancer. Limited evidence when there are some studies are positive, others are negative, others are no, or studies have lots of methodological problems. Inadequate, when, when there is really almost nothing um, of quality. Or, and we have thought that we need to have another group, evidence suggesting lack of carcinogenicity, which is almost never used. It has been used once uh, for one compound, which I don't know how ended up uh, being evaluated for carcinogenicity because there was hardly anything on it. Um, then for the animal data, we do the same thing, sufficient, limited, inadequate, and you have a precise definition on the IRC website if you have an interest. And then we combined A and B, plus taking into account the other relevant data, in particular the mechanisms, to finally classify the products as 1, 2A, 2B, 3 or 4, and uh, you will have the definition. Let's see uh, where is it. Here, in group 1, that's for carcinogenic to humans. When a product is classified in there, we are sure it's really a carcinogen, and we already have sufficient epidemiological data to conclude it's a carcinogen. When we have less data available in humans, it may end up in group 2A, probably carcinogenic to humans, with limited evidence in humans, but sufficient evidence in animals. Group 2B, it's possibly carcinogenic to humans, so limited in humans, again, less than sufficient in animals, <coughs> or inadequate in humans, and sufficient in animals, also various combinations. Group 3 is not classifiable. I insist on group 3 because very often when agents are put in group 3, people say not carcinogenic. It does not mean not carcinogenic. It means we do not know, we don't have enough data to do a classification. So it doesn't mean not carcinogenic, it means we don't know, which is not exactly the same thing even if some wishes to uh, present it otherwise. So up to the end of 2010, when we had these numbers of product, it has not been yet updated, so maybe tiny differences. There were more or less since 1969, 930 agents which have been classified, 107 are in group one, 58 in 2A, 249 in 2B, 512, so more than one half in 3, and one in non-carcinogenic to humans. So how do we then assess, or in the meantime we assess, we looked at this, the causality. And again there it's an historical paper by Hill in the UK. We defined criteria for causality in epidemiological studies and it's funny to see that he did that, mostly to look at smoking and cancer. So nowadays uh, everyone is convinced, but in the uh, late 50s, in fact in 51, when with Dole, they published a paper which was not the first. It's always cited as the first case control study on smoking and lung cancer. In fact, it was the second, the first one being an American one by Winder and Graham, five months before 
the Dolan Hill. I don't know why it's less cited, because it was a bigger study and finding the same thing, but you never know, history sometimes says things. So in any event, what are the criteria for causality? The strength of the association, which means that of course when you get a relative risk of 20, smoking, you know, multiplies by 20 your risk of lung cancer, that's good. I mean, you tend to believe in it. If it's 1.2, <laughs> you need more arguments. Consistency across epidemiological studies, if you find the same results in China, in North America, and in the middle of Africa, again, you tend to believe in it. Specificity, that it should be specific for a given exposure, well-defined exposure, and a given cancer, that would be best. We are getting back to the uh, infectious disease model, one virus, one disease. Plausibility, how credible will it be based on what else we know about this agent? Coherence with other studies, other data types, or the uh, toxicology, the whatever else. Experimental evidence, if we get rid of that exposure, are we going to see the incidence decreasing? That, of course, would be a strong argument. And analogy, which is similarity of agents which may belong to the same family are not exactly the same, but we suppose will work in the same way. That's something we can use a little bit when we think about nanotechnology, nanoparticles, thinking about ultra-fine uh, dust. We can think about analogy. So now, uh, in the old days, life was simple. When Ernst Winder did his study, it's easy to assess uh, smoking just by asking questions to people about whether or not they smoke, and how many cigarettes a day, what age, uh, uh, I mean, for how many years. These are simple questions people can answer, and then you see whether or not they get lung cancer. And nowadays, uh, when you're interested into environmental contaminants, you cannot ask people which kind of air do you breathe, what are the things you find in, in the air in your house or on your work site? That's easier because they may know with what they are working. But for a lot of environmental concerns, we cannot use simple questionnaires. So we need to become more sophisticated, i.e., which means we need more money to measure things better with markers. Markers of exposure, because it's one thing to measure, for example, I don't know, formaldehyde in the air of a city in Sao Paulo. It's the city in the world with the highest formaldehyde levels due to the use of biofuels. <laughs> Something is not always good for everything. Um, so that's one thing. But then you may also want to measure how much is inhaled, how much is uh, getting down to the cell level, how much is going to be integrated, and so on and so forth. So a number of things dealing to a better definition of exposure. And then we can try to find early markers of effects in a way for screening or whatever before we get to cancer. And all of that, of course, is going to be modulated by markers of susceptibility because we are not all equal. So rapidly now, the risk factors for cancer, genetics, lifestyle, and environment. Genetics. Um, of course, you know that there are very well-known cancer genes which are going to entail a huge risk for the people who have a mutated gene. The example, the best, are BRCA1, A2 for breast cancer. If you are a woman with such a mutated gene, then your probability of getting breast cancer is very high, depending on which population group you belong to, between 60 to up to 80% probability of doing breast cancer over your lifetime. So that's very important for the person herself and for her family. But on a population scale, it only explains very few cases. So that does not explain the epidemic we see. Plus, you don't change your genetic uh, background within 20 years. And then more relevant at the population level is the issue of genetic polymorphisms. And there are more and more studies looking at these kind of things but there, the risks are usually very, very small. Um, more of the studies are not fully concordant, to say the least. So it's uh, something maybe to be developed, but we are not yet there. So I took, nevertheless, one example of such a study, which we did in China with a student who was working with me on an Erasmus Mundus course. We looked at 
some genetic polymorphism for esophageal cancer, which is quite frequent in some areas of China, and, and did a, a nice little study. Uh, but for those interested, you can get the paper, whatever. Is there any specificity of genetic determinants in the South? Of course, as I said, our genetic backgrounds are somewhat different, but we don't really have much data coming from countries of the South. We have some from China. We have a few from Latin America. We hardly have anything from Africa, so we don't really know. And, and for the time being, um, I don't think it should be a priority. What we know a lot is on uh, behavioral lifestyle risk factors. And if we look at the contrast on the role of tobacco and diet versus infections between Africa here, Sub-Saharan Africa, and part of Europe, then we see, of course, what we would expect, and there are some French who remain on that side, but forget it, that the role of infection is going to be much bigger in the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, and contrary, tobacco and diet were more important in European countries. So there, it's a picture of the tobacco market as it was in Zimbabwe back in 1992, when we had there the first African conference on tobacco or health in Africa. Not a very uh, popular conference in the uh, Zimbabwe context because they export lots of tobacco. So we had it in, uh, in a well-guarded uh, um, hotel because some people didn't like that idea. But nevertheless, it was interesting. It was trying to do something to avoid this from being the, the future for Africa. But we failed. I mean, uh, tobacco epidemic, of course, is growing in, in Africa. Um, the problem is that we can think in a way of tobacco as an infectious agent. It goes across population of the world. It started in the richest countries of the world among men, and then 40 years later among women. And in society, first the upper class, and then the lower classes. And then it's moving around, similar pattern all over the world. And it's terrible, and in a way, we are not able to stop even that epidemic. Uh, so when the IRRC looked for the first time at the role of tobacco in cancer in 1986, we concluded that all cavity, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, squamous cell carcinoma, lung cancer, pancreas, urinary tract, and bladder cancer are all increased in tobacco smokers. When we redid the same exercise in 2004, we added nasal cavity, uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, liver, stomach, kidney, cervical cancer, and myeloid leukemia. Why were we not able to find immediately obvious cancers? Because in fact, the relative risk of getting stomach cancer or liver cancer if you're a smoker is of the order of two, whereas for lung cancer, it's at least 20, 30. So then of course, it's more difficult to um, be able to identify smaller risk. With the most recent update, which is the volume 100 of the monographs in 2009, which is now available on the site, or well, not yet for tobacco, it should be available within two weeks. Uh, we added uh, colorectal cancer and mucinous type of ovarian cancer and recognized that even for female breast cancer, there is some evidence for the role of tobacco. Uh, and then for the uh, secondhand smoke, passive smoking, we added to the lung, larynx and pharynx, and the role also, which I think is very important, of parental smoking, either mother smoking during pregnancy and or mother and or father smoking in her early childhood as playing a role for childhood cancer and childhood leukemia. So for the tobacco products in the world, we have a huge variety of products, Cretex, for example, in Indonesia, BDs, Nargile smoking, water pipe, or whatever. All of these products, once we have sufficient data, are recognized as carcinogens. So tobacco, I think there's no question, it's really a carcinogen. What's worse is that in the poorest countries, the tobacco which is being sold is quite often the poorest quality tobacco. 
uh, when the tar, there has been a tar limit put per cigarette in America, in, the, in Europe at 12 milligrams, for example, then some tobacco lead to much higher content in tars. And when you look at cigarettes in Africa, the tar levels may be still as high as 30 milligrams per cigarette. So the way the cigarettes were back in the 50s in our countries. Uh, so it's poor quality data, not data, tobacco which is being sold there. I uh, have some example from Morocco, but I will pass on that because time is running. Cannabis, just one word, um, because cannabis smoking is also associated with an increased risk of lung cancer. Here it's a meta-analysis we did in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, where we found that people who smoke cannabis have a relative risk of about two to three for lung cancer. 2.4 after adjustment for tobacco smoking and other compounders. So cannabis smoking is not less dangerous than tobacco smoking. And that's the way cannabis was being used traditionally in Northern Africa, meaning small quantities of cannabis uh, smoked only by, by men, and usually in small quantities. It's not the young people of today who may smoke several joints per day. So it will be worse. Air pollution, I will pass on that one, although it's a beautiful slide, meaning that people with little means can do wonderful study. This was a study done in Guangzhou by Liu King and um, uh, Men Sang Yu, a wonderful woman, uh, long term, uh, I think she's dead now, cancer epidemiologist. They looked at the effect of air pollution by measuring the size of a window. And we see that the better the ventilated an apartment is the lesser the risk of lung cancer. Okay. Alcohol, we all know it's carcinogenic. Um, I will just say one word about alcohol and female breast cancer because there is an increase for consumption of alcohol. It leads to an increase in breast cancer. When I say that in Bordeaux, you know what Bordeaux is well known for, all over the world, of course, is for its wine. So they hate that message. And they said wine is good for you, the French paradox, and so on and so forth. Yes, but it increases also the risk of breast cancer. In the South, again, we have the same consideration that we had for tobacco, poor quality alcohol, lots of contaminants done in really poor conditions, and sometimes drank at hot temperature, which make things worse, for example, mixed with mate in South America. Diet and physical exercise, there's nothing specific, except that in the way, uh, provided diet is rich enough, hey, having a food to eat, diet used to be much better in the tropics than in our countries, and uh, richer in grains and cereals, uh, less meat, which is good, less fat, and unfortunately, with globalization, we are even exporting uh, um, uh, chickens to Africa, and we are exporting um, dietary products to countries which were not using them and were doing fine without them, so globalization has a negative impact. There are nevertheless some problems with traditional diet. I will cite uh, the problem of contamination by aflatoxin of uh, peanuts in particular, in, in Africa because they are kept in poor condition, humid condition, so then aflatoxin grows and it's very potent carcinogen. So with better way of conservation of the food, that would help in decreasing the liver cancer incidence um, and also some traditional food, salted fish, for example, in Guangzhou, in Canton region, and some traditional pharmacopoeia. Reproductive life, uh, you know that. Again, there, women in the South should have less breast cancer because they have more pregnancy at a younger age. Nevertheless, we see very clear increases in breast cancer, in particular in Africa, and we don't have any idea of why it's increasing. So need for study. Sexual life, that's linked to the viruses, but I speak too much, so I will pass on that. For biological agents, I will just cite the ones which are linked to cancer, 
And if you are interested, you can get later on, I'm sure, on the site, a copy of the slide, so you will have more uh, information. The viruses which have been uh, classified as group one, therefore recognized carcinogen for humans, are the HPV, the HIV, one, uh, HIV one in group one, HIV two in group two, <laughs> if that's the case. Uh, hepatitis B and C, both in group one, viruses, recognized carcinogen, epstein barr virus, human herpes virus type 8, human T cell leukemia virus. Among the bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, of course, for stomach cancer, but also for some forms of lymphoma. And the parasite, the schistomyasis, especially for bladder cancer, but also some role in colon cancer. Opistorchis viverini for cholangiocarcinoma, mostly in Asia, in Vietnam, Cambodia, but also in some other parts of the world. And Clonorchis sinensis, again, cholangiocarcinoma, mostly in China, as the name indicates. So I will pass on all of that, but you can find it if you are interested in the, um, on, the, on the website, I'm sure. And in my papers, um, you can, uh, we can put also some of the references, you will find them. I'll just say a word to finish with what has been occupying me just before I came here today on occupational and environmental risk factors. Uh, you know, occupational carcinogens, when they are identified, usually have been found to be associated with very high increased risk. For example, benzene in workers uh, exposed uh, will lead to uh, lymphoma. Um, and uh, asbestos, leading, of course, to mesothelioma and also an increased risk of lung cancer. So usually very high relative risk. But of course, on a population scale, only a few people work in a given occupation. So on a population scale, it doesn't have a huge impact. And you have exactly the opposite for environmental agents. Very small increased risk, one point something, 1.2 if you live in a very polluted environment for the risk of lung cancer based on the particulate matter in the air. So a very low risk, but that one applies to whole population. So there is really a need to study these things because the few data we have, of course, have identified carcinogens in the air, in the water, in the soil, in the food, in objects of daily living, in plastics, in whatever chemical carcinogens and physical carcinogens. We are all exposed to ionizing radiation, x-rays in the medical setting if we live close to a nuclear plant. We are all exposed to non-ionizing radiation. We all use cell phones. We may live close to high power lines. This uh, event, this exposure, are associated with very small increased risk, most often at a population scale but nevertheless, something. The problem is they apply to the whole world almost. So we need to do something about it. And uh, I will stop with my slide just to tell you that um, on Monday and Tuesday, there will be in New York at the United Nations, a meeting of a high level expert committee on the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases with a focus on countries of the South. So when I found out about that meeting, I was all excited because I felt, you know, that's the occasion that the UN will say something. A resolution, what is a UN resolution? Well, of course, I mean, it, it has some impact, even if it's not compulsory for the countries to follow what is being said in there. Nevertheless, it's a recognition of a phenomenon. So therefore, I was very happy when I found out about this meeting. And then I looked at all the papers, which are available on the UN site or on WHO site, because it's WHO which did prepare the technical papers. And what have they written in their resolution? Because, of course, it's already written before it will be signed. They have written that people should not smoke, should not eat too much fat, too much sugar, too much salt. There's nothing on environmental. I mean, there's one paragraph recognizing that there is pollution of the air. Okay, fine. There's nothing almost on occupation except workers' education. But what does it mean, workers' education, when you have little girls, eight years old, working with asbestos in India, covered with asbestos dust because they are cutting materials, 
tissue which have been made with asbestos fibers and their only protection is a bandana on their face. So I felt that this um, UN uh, resolution may be somewhat missing something. I'm nothing against smoke less and eat well, uh, but it's not good enough. Uh, so, and even the eat well is a serious problem because apparently the U.S. doesn't even want to vote that resolution because there is some pressure from, I don't know, Coca-Cola, have you ever heard of that name? Who say that people should be free to drink as much uh, sugar drinks than they want. And there is nothing about the environmental contaminants. So I wrote up um, an open letter to the uh, UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, which I sent yesterday, just before coming here, and to the Director General of WHO, and to the press. I don't know if it will have any impact, but I was very happy we got, I got almost 200 signatures of very, uh, imp some very important people in many countries of the world, including in the US, uh, but in Africa, in Asia, in all other places, saying that it would be worth considering some of the diseases, because they also limit it to cancer, cardiovascular, respiratory, and diabetes. And there is a need also maybe to look at reproductive outcomes, because that's a serious problem in many countries, a problem with fertility, and neurologic diseases, uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer, we all talk about Alzheimer, and maybe psychiatric diseases, which may all have some environmental link. And there is a need, of course, to look behind tobacco and diet, and also include other factors. I don't think it will have any impact, but we can try. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, we started a little late, so I apologize we ended a little late. Uh, uh, maybe we can take two questions. Is there a burning question from the audience? Please. Well, I have many slides on, uh, not, not in this one maybe, on uh, how much, yes, in this one, on how much is due to the environment. It's exceedingly difficult to have a precise quantification. So the uh, estimates which have been published, the first one were published by Dole and Pito in the 60s, it's here, where they said that for, um, for example, industrial products, you have it there, less than 1%, due to, um, I'm not good to it does no longer work. well, less than 1% due to industrial products, 4% for occupation. So that published in 1981, so based on the exposure in the 60s, done in the U.S., although it was done in Pito to U.K., it was done on the white U.S. male population, less than 65. So a very well-defined population. It has been extrapolated to the whole world. Uh, whereas it should not, because the prevalence of exposures were very different. Then the IRC, a new IRC in a way, the one at least from five years ago, published even um, lower estimates. That was done under Peter Boyle, someone who did not worry much about the environment. And they say 2.5% of cancer death that was done for France, so it was a French population this time, in 2000, 2.5% for occupation, and for pollutants, 0.07%. So not even rounded up to 0.1%, because you never know people could worry. Um, the way they got at it, you will find on the slides, I mean, they hardly took into account anything. So of course, I mean, if you don't take into account anything, you don't find much. And uh, they always chose um, what would lead to the smallest estimate. But if we do that, then they themselves conclude, and when they are the quotes, they are exactly the words from IARC, that they cannot find a specific cause for the majority of cancer. In non-smokers, 85% are not explained by their computation. So my own guess is that maybe environment has something to do. Because as I said, there are three classes of causes of cancer, genetics, but that only explains a few percent at a population scale. 10% if we want to be exceedingly generous. So it's not genetics. Behaviors, 50, 60%. And the rest. At a minimum, there is 30%, 40% left. What could it be if it's not the environment? 
there are not an infinite number of possibilities. I mean, some may say it's God because he's unhappy with us, so he is creating cancer. I don't know. Uh, but maybe the fact that in our environment, that's what has changed most in the last 40 years. It's the presence, the increasing presence of carcinogens, and it's not only carcinogens, teratogens, reprotoxic, in, in our environment. So most probably it explains at least more than 0.07%. Dose. Of course, it depends on the dose and on the duration of exposure. When you think in terms of dose, always keep in mind there are two things, the daily dose and the duration. And the best example is tobacco. When you multiply by two the number of cigarettes per day, you multiply by two your risk of lung cancer. When you multiply by two the number of years during which you smoke, you multiply by 20 your risk of cancer. So the issue of duration, so low dose, is nothing to be really reassured about if you are exposed over many, many years. And environmental exposure, we start being exposed when we are conceived, and we keep on being exposed all our life long and even after death if we are not cremated. Well, that's a good note on which to close. Thank you very much, Dr. Sassler. Well, that was a tour, tour de force. That was the most comprehensive talk on cancer.